The college football landscape as we know it keeps changing with every passing day. Whether it's conference realignment, playoff format, or skyrocketing media rights deals, it's safe to say that college football looks a lot different from what it was 10 years ago and will continue to evolve as the years go on. But will those differences be for the better or worse? I wanted to look more into NIL and what impact we can expect it will have on the sport we all know and love. Now, compensation for college athletes is not a new idea. Even the earliest of collegiate competitions involved some form of compensation. We can trace this all the way back to 1852 when Harvard and Yale competed in a rowing tournament, which marked the first ever intercollegiate competition in the U.S. This was a sponsored event with paid travel, expensive prizes, and quoted as having all the alcohol you can drink. Even back then, football was the driver for revenue in the college ranks, dating all the way back to Princeton versus Yale in 1880, which drew 40,000 fans and generated $25,000 in ticket sales, which is about $750,000 in today's currency. Colleges offered all manner of compensation to top tier athletes. Yale supposedly lured a player by the name of James Hogan with free meals, free tuition, a trip to Cuba, and exclusive rights to sell scorecards from his games. And as the years went on, big changes came to the sport, but players getting paid was not what caused outside forces to step in. What really altered the path of college athletics was the unregulated violence that occurred in the early years. Offenses implementing the flying wedge formation and little protective equipment caused 18 deaths in 1905. President Theodore Roosevelt had to do something and a meeting was formed between Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, which ultimately formed what we know today as the NCAA. Organized primarily as a standard-setting body, the association also expressed a view at its founding about compensating college athletes, stating that no athlete shall represent a college or university in any intercollegiate game or contest who is paid or receives directly or indirectly any money or financial concession. However, even with this new body, top players were continuing to get paid in the college ranks. In the 1940s, Hugh McElhenney, a running back at the University of Washington, became known as the first player ever to take a pay cut in salary to play pro football. He was quoted saying, a wealthy guy puts big bucks under my pillow every time I score a touchdown. Hell, I can't afford to graduate. And in 1948, college sports adopts the sanity code. This code further went on to condemn payment of play for student athletes. However, it also introduced the idea of schools covering tuition. This evolved in 1956 to include the payment of full room and board, basically similar to what we have in place now. And there have been countless lawsuits against the NCAA over the years. Most bring up the Sherman Act, which prohibits contracts in restraint of fair trade and commerce. The recent court filing of NCAA versus Alston argued the NCAA basically has a monopoly on the market and can enforce any law without fear of market loss and not allowing athletes to profit off NIL was a violation of the Sherman Act. And the NCAA argued current laws held allowed for competitive balance among teams across the country. And there was a concern with having college football turn into another NFL and hurting its unique favor with fans, saying student athletes play for the love of the game rather than money. Now the NCAA doesn't deny its violations of the Sherman Act, rather it claims immunity from it on the basis of it not being commercial enterprises. However, Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh submitted a concurring opinion where he states, nowhere else in America can businesses get away with agreeing not to pay their workers a fair market rate, on the theory that their product is defined by not paying their workers a fair market rate. And under ordinary principles of antitrust law, it is not evident why college sports should be any different. The NCAA is not above the law. And that brought us to the spring of 2022 where the NCAA released interim guidelines regarding NIL deals, basically stating two things, direct pay for play was still prohibited and no performance related payments. So how is NIL affecting college sports and its current student athletes? One of the first things to pop up when the new rule went into effect were private collectives. Collectives are groups of donors independent from the universities that pool money to pay players in the form of NIL activities slash opportunities for fans to join exclusive memberships to support athletes. These collectives also serve to secure brand deals for the students. Just about every Power 5 team in the country has one. So what effect on competition can we expect from these new NIL deals? 73% of athletic directors think NIL will decrease a school's chance to be competitive in college sports. However, Tulane AD Troy Dannon was quoted saying, the kids that are going to Alabama are still going to Alabama, the kids that are going to Southern Cal are still going to Southern Cal,
Cal, and the kids that are going to Tulane are still going to Tulane. There's also a growing belief in college sports that the athletes best position to cash in on their fame might not necessarily be those whose teams get the most TV time, but rather those with the most social media followers. Wouldn't you want to go to a school where you're able to showcase your ability in order to draw attention from entities that would be interested in using your name to profit their company? This would come not by going to the biggest school necessarily, but the school that will allow you to play. We're definitely seeing this in the transfer portal era, where players are jumping from school to school, doing anything they can to get the most playing time possible. And NIL as a whole still seems to be in its wild west phase, with the little guidance that's been given from the NCAA. Adam Fleischer of the Illinois Illini Guardians Collective was quoted saying, I found it disappointing but understandable right now that the NCAA, as well as the coaches that you've seen taking their thoughts to Congress, have all approached this in terms of trying to delineate what should not be done and what cannot be done and what must be avoided. So while everybody is rushing to reach some consensus of what's not allowed, there's very little guidance as to what NIL can be and what it should be and what its potential is. And no one is quite certain where all this ends. The only thing that is certain is that the college football landscape will be vastly different over the next decade.